Welcome. It's my pleasure to, uh, to introduce our guests for our fireside chat this evening. I'm Tony D'Angelo, and I direct our new house program in financial, uh, called the Financial and Investor Communications Emphasis. Um, I would like to thank the gentleman to my left, Gary Kaminsky, who is a new house alum. He was a broadcast journalism major. Uh, while at Newhouse and went on to um, quite a career at, among other places, Morgan Stanley, where he was a senior vice president, Capital Markets. Wait, wait, vice chairman. Vice chairman, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Capital Markets editor at CNBC, co-host of Wall Street Week, and a bunch of other bona fides that he brings to the party. He helps make our student annual student benchmark trip possible here to New York City. So our students who are in attendance, you can thank Gary for that. It's very much appreciated. And uh, so as we did uh, last year, we're having this public forum, which is going to be, uh, we'll have articles about this on New House Media, and we're also taping it uh, so that we can uh, leverage it that way. And thanks to Penn Pendleton, uh, Appreciate Penn's involvement in the program as well. He helped set up our program last year that had to do with anticipating the 10th anniversary of the Great Recession and what we've learned from that. Penn has recruited Mr. Julian Wheatland, uh, who is the formal chief operating officer of Cambridge Analytica and its parent company as well, who is here to participate in this fireside chat with Gary and really bring th some things to light about what happened, what we can learn from it. As he indicated to me, he is now um, sticking his head above the parapet <laughs> and is more than happy to give his unique perspective on that hugely disruptive event and what we can learn from it. So with that, I'd like to thank each of these three gentlemen for the role in this, and I'm looking forward to learning along with you. So welcome. Thank you, gentlemen. And thank you, Penn. And uh, Penn just reminded me at the uh, event last year when we were talking about um, fallout and, and reflecting on where things were um, 10 years post the financial crisis, was actually one of the panelists who talked about this idea of data collection, social media, and uh, the responsibility of all of that that was going to possibly be the uh, the next crisis, and here we are a year later, and certainly uh, that was somewhat of a great look into the future, uh, given what's happened over the last 12 months. We uh, delivered. Yeah. You know, across, across social media. So I'm, I'm actually quite excited because uh, somebody, uh, how many people are on Facebook now? Is it uh, 3 billion or something? I'm, 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 I'm one of the few people, I guess, probably in this room, if not the only one who's not on Facebook. Um, and so like many people, when I heard about uh, Cambridge Analytica. I only knew what I knew from uh, what I read in the paper, and so I'm going to learn quite a bit today. And 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 knowing that many of you are thinking about careers and thinking about things that are going to be at the forefront of of journalism and especially related to financial journalism in the future, uh, this is definitely going to be a timely thing because companies are going to need, as Julian will get into, uh, people that have a an interest and a passion in. Uh, in protecting the data and protecting the information. So uh, it's, it, it's going to be a real growth industry when, when one thinks about it. Uh, so with that, I want to welcome Julian and say okay. thank you for joining us. And to all of those that are hopefully watching this um, uh, with the follow through on the, on, on, on the tape. Um, Julian, why don't we start with what is, what is and what, it, what was and tell us about Cambridge Analytica because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding. Even if you go online and you Google it, uh, it's not really that clear what the company is or was and, and, and what the mission statement was and how it was built. Sure. Um, well, if we go through the history of, of the company and the various entities, um, the original company was uh, SCL, which stood for Strategic Communication Laboratories. Uh, and that was set up in the UK in, I guess, about 2005. Uh, and it was set up with a um, uh, particular focus of providing a service to uh, governments, primarily the UK government and the US government, uh, to be able to conduct strategic communication operations um, in foreign countries. So if uh, one of our governments wanted to uh, um, uh, project influence 
overseas or if it wanted to uh, communicate with locals in particular high-risk areas then that was the uh, that was the purpose of SCL and that was I said I've been 2005 and that's how I got involved I was actually investing uh, managing some money at that time and we invested in SCL uh, when it first got started and I joined the board of SCL uh, as an investor director and became chairman of it and was chairman of it up until about May this year so um, uh, that business did very well uh, and until the financial crisis came along and uh, when the financial crisis came along government budgets pretty much shut down and to convince uh, an army general that um, uh, uh, that it was better to spend money on communications than to buy a new tank became increasingly difficult and so the uh, the business uh, branched out it branched out uh, using its communications capability into the elections market and it uh, assisted political parties um, around the world on uh, on elections and in 2013 uh, SCL formed a joint venture with some US investors and created a company called Cambridge Analytica and the purpose of Cambridge Analytica was to take that understanding of communications and um, integrating communications with social sciences and to then blend that with uh, big data analytics and uh, and that was that was the focus of uh, Cambridge Analytica and in the first instance its focus was purely in the political market in the US uh, and that was one that that was a um, that was a straightforward marketing decision uh, Obama had already uh, invested heavily in capability in digital communications and data and there was a gap in the market on the Republican side of the market and so that's where the company went um, and became very successful in that market worked in the 2014 elections uh, which was a success worked in the 2016 elections which was a great success depending on your point of view and um, and that's how we came about okay so let's go back to the uh, origin of S SCL what what was the communication you say the army general has to make a determination to take certain dolls what was the data collection used for in terms of trying to communicate a viewpoint or trying to influence certain uh, aspects of governments what what was what what was the company doing yeah so um, I like to think of SCL the original SCL capability as small data analytics and it moved on to big data analytics uh, in Cambridge Analytica as technology enabled that and so what the original company was doing was conducting research in local markets understanding what individual homogeneous groupings uh, there were in the uh, in the electorate or in the market or in the in the target audience as we would uh, as, as we would term it and understanding what were the issues and drivers of behavior within each of those individual segments within the market uh, and then under trying to understand what it was that would um, uh, uh, that would appeal to certain certain sections of the audience uh, and, and what would turn sections certain sections of the audience off which if you think about it I mean if we were working for you know, US Department of Defense for example and they wanted to influence young males in a Pakistan border village then the very first thing that they did was they conducted research within that target audience and they understood what were the drivers of behavior within that, uh, within that grouping so before we've even done any communications we've actually aided understanding between two groups of people that are about as uh, diverse as you could imagine um, and then once once you've understood what are the issues the places the words the names the organizations the people the institutions that are the big influences on uh, uh, on the lives of those young males then you can start to think about how you might design a communications program that would um, for example steer them away from extremism so so you may be limited in terms of specifics that you can give using that example but who's actually is it analysts uh, that are out in the field in that example of Pakistan that are writing reports that are then being fed into a uh, an overall thesis uh, I mean because you're really talking about specific behavior who's doing the actual um, data collection I guess you yeah, have data collection or 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 putting together the the, the profile so um, uh, wherever possible data collection would be undertaken by local people 
Uh, and then um, uh, the, the surveys were designed by the psychologists and communication experts um, in London at that time. And the output was analyzed by uh, those same psychologists, communication experts. Can you, uh, can you cite, maybe not again by specific example, but can you cite uh, what would have been one of the most successful campaigns uh, during that period, you know, pre-Cambridge Analytica? Uh, what, was, what was deemed a very successful campaign? What was the net result? Well, I've just mentioned one, which yeah. I think was successful, and I'm, I, I probably won't, if you'll forgive me, I won't go into the nature of the communications program yeah. associated with it. Um, I'll, I'll mention one that, that actually, um, uh, th the, the founders and intellectual inspiration for SCL did before they, uh, uh, they formed SCL, which I think is quite interesting. Uh, in South Africa, at the, uh, at the time of the first free elections in South Africa, uh, the team, Nigel Oakes and his team, were engaged by the ANC. Um, now, not, as you might think, to, uh, uh, to help the ANC win the election. That was actually a foregone conclusion. Uh, their remit was to work in the townships across South Africa and uh, prevent civil unrest and violence during the elections process, uh, which was spectacularly successful, particularly if you compare it with the same exercise that went on in Zimbabwe next door where there was um, terrible bloodshed. All right, so let's, let's take it now to uh, Cambridge Analytica. So a determination was made that the Democrats in the United States had done a good job in terms of um, accessing social media using, using digital communications. Um, where, um, so this opportunity was, was the, the opportunity set was there. How did a what was the determination? How was, what was the next steps in order to then say, we can add value in terms of to the Republican Party identifying um, their voter base that they weren't successfully doing with the digital world? Mm. So um, first of all, it was conducting a large amount of uh, surveys. And surveys that were not just preference-based, but were also issues-based to understand what were the drivers of preferences. Um, and also, it was collecting, it was accessing a lot of publicly available information, the um, uh, uh, voter registration files that the uh, uh, Republican Party had itself, and also um, uh, a number of offline databases that were commercially available. And that data was, or those data were, <coughs> were, were analyzed uh, by data scientists. I'll come back to what that means in a moment. Um, data scientists in order to, number one, understand who might be, for example, Republican voters. Uh, but actually, that was not that novel. That was not that creative. And, and, there's, and it's not that, on the face of it, it's not that difficult to do. There's lots of people that say they have those models. And I think they probably do. Um, but that's not enough. What you really want to do is you really want to understand from the, the, there's the group of people that would be Republican voters, and there's the group of people that may be Republican voters, and there's the group of people who aren't ever going to be Republican voters. And you want to concentrate on the first two. But what you want to do with the first two is different, because if someone's definitely going to be a Republican voter, actually all of your messaging to them is a get out the vote message. It's persuading them to not to forget to vote or to be motivated to vote. In the middle group, then actually what you're trying to do is you're trying to uh, direct persuasion messages to them. Um, uh, why they should vote Republican versus voting um, um, a Democrat. And again, this is where the analytics comes in because the reason people might vote Republican is very diverse. or well, the reasons people might vote Republican are very diverse. And so um, uh, what you're really trying to understand is, you know, what is the drivers of that potential Republican voting behavior? What's important to people? Is it, um, is it fiscal matters? Is it social matters? Is it military matters? Whatever it is. And then that enables you to talk to them on the issues that they're most interested in. I mean, it's fascinating because, I mean, really, if you go back 50 years ago, those three buckets of identifiable potential voters are the same 50 years ago was there today. But there, it was done in town halls. It was done in terms of uh, specific events where, where we didn't have the direct connectivity with social media. So I think that's probably a good uh, segue to say, OK, then how does the, 
the business model then evolve to utilizing social media platforms to go out and target to those three markets? Where, where does that come together? So, um, I, I mean, if anybody's done an, any, uh, uh, any work within digital communications, then you will know that you know, Facebook and Google are the two biggest platforms in the world for um, uh, targeting advertisements. And you, you can go along to Facebook and you can give them uh, an audience, say, I don't know, 100,000 people, and say, actually, what I'd like you to do is give me people that look like them. And you don't need any data to do that. You need to have your original 100,000, but they've got all the data and they'll give you back the, um, uh, not the physical IDs, but they'll give you back the cookies or their channel your ads to the people who, uh, uh, who look like your original target audience. Um, would you look, would, let, let's just stop there for one second because this is where I need a little understanding. So you've now created in your uh, data, in your, in your data profiling, what a, let's call it a potential, so somebody who's not undecided, somebody who might gravitate towards the party. So you've identified certain characteristics of what that person would look like. Well, I, I, I mean. Look, when, when you go, when you interact with Facebook or Google, what is it that you're actually giving them before they can give you a, uh, an advertising market, like a, a target market? What, what, what information are you providing to them? You're providing them cookie IDs. Uh, uh, and, and a cookie is, is uh, an identifier within your web browser which identifies you and the things that you search for. It doesn't actually know who you are. Just knows your IP address. It, it might know who you are, actually, but um, well, I don't like that. So, so, <laughs> so, so, why might it know who you are? So there are uh, there are platforms available that will enable me, for example, to um, give a list of, let's say, a hundred thousand names and addresses, and that platform will give me back a hundred thousand cookies. I actually can't ever see which name is which cookie. I imagine they can, but I don't know how they work. Um, but, uh, but they, don't, they never reveal that. that, that there's, there's, the privacy, there's the privacy box, yeah? I might know you're in that 100,000. Actually, I don't even know for certain whether or not there's been a 100% match in there. So almost certainly there wasn't. So even if you were in that 100,000, I don't know for certain you're in the batch of cookies that comes, uh, cookie IDs that come back. But I get, let's say, 100,000 cookie IDs that come <coughs> back. And associated with that cookie ID it are characteristics of your of what the platform company and that might be Google it might be Facebook it might be an independent um, cookie provider what they believe your profile is what age you are what interests you have etc cetera, etc cetera. Oh, is that um, would you consider that to be a very strong um, identifier of potential target market um, I, I, I consider it to be quite strong. I mean, if, if we wanted to really to understand the market, we'd be out, we'd be conducting uh, research, we'd be conducting surveys, we'd be looking at a lot more data than just what are the, uh, the characteristics that they associate with you on your cookie. And, and actually, I mean, you guys probably know this already, but you can go to Google and you can, you can click on the right button and they'll tell you everything they think about you. Um, and then you can take a view as to whether or not you think it's right or wrong. Where, do, where, where does one find that? <laughs> one of these guys will tell you. <laughs> yeah. it's, it, 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 it's on there somewhere. I've clicked on it myself. Um, so actually, that's relatively new. Yeah. And they're aware that uh, there's more pressure now for people to be able to see the information that um, uh, these, these platforms are holding on you. And of course, they're operating in Europe. And now in, in Europe, GDPR is uh, under GDPR. Cookie data is classified as personal data, even if they don't have your name and address. So, should I be? Um, uh, this is a personal question. Should I be concerned that I utilize Gmail for my most of my email interaction now? Uh, you mean in terms of are they reading your emails? Well, somebody obviously has access to read them, right? Uh, I mean, you need to ask Google that. Yeah. I can't. I can't okay. answer that. <laughs> but they're, they're reading them in the sense that they're looking for keywords. I believe they do. I yeah. believe they do. Yeah. Yeah, okay. and, and, it, and, it, and it increases their, um, their, 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 their confidence in their profiling of you. Okay, so let's now get to the, to the engagement between Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and again, recognizing that we're not going to talk about 
anything that might be uh, still subject to um, investigation, litigation. But Cambridge makes a determination and Facebook makes a determination that it's a partnership that Cambridge is trying to identify and target certain markets. Am I correct? No. Okay, so how does the engagement come together? So uh, we never had an engagement of that type with Facebook. Um, we use the Facebook platform for uh, putting out digital ads, but that's all we've ever done with Facebook or Cambridge Analytica ever did with Facebook. What I think you're referring to, however, is uh, what we did do is we licensed some data that was Facebook data from a third party service uh, um, intermediary. And the data uh, contained, amongst other things, uh, people's likes. And it was in an attempt to better understand uh, the link between um, uh, what people were interested in and, and what, the, what the digital data had on them. So we licensed that data and, um, uh, from a company called GSR. And uh, let's just talk a little bit in, in detail now about that. Um, I wasn't in the company at the time it was done. It was done in 2014. Although I was chairman of the parent company, the, uh, the subsi subsidiary company was, um, uh, th there wasn't a shareholding in that company at that time. It was, uh, it was acquired later. And, and then I went in, in at the beginning of 2015, and that's when I took over as COO and CFO. So I wasn't there at the time in 2014, but I have unsurprisingly looked at the contracts that were, um, uh, that were used. And it's very clear in the contracts that this third party intermediary um, took all responsibility for ensuring that uh, regulatory compliance, legal compliance, full, um, uh, full compliance with what was then the Data Protection Act in the UK, and also that they had obtained all users' permissions to do it. So the company licensed that, I think, in good faith. And what we would, they were trying to do <coughs> is build models to learn about how people behaved. Now, what I can also tell you is they tell me it wasn't very useful. It, um, uh, we got much better data uh, by, by, by going out and surveying and collecting our own data. But it, it was a time of experimentation and innovation. And that's what, we were trying to do, what they were trying to do. So, um, so we licensed Facebook data. Um, uh, from this company GSR with a view to better understanding people's di digi online behavior. Okay, so Cambridge is doing what they always do, which is gathering information, trying to come up with profiles, and there was an opportunity to license this information from a third party. Um, is third party licensing of uh, data information, is that, is that a big business? Yeah, huge, okay. huge, yeah. And um, huge in the sense that so Facebook is selling it's their data they own the data they give you the platform for free and in return you give them your data they own your data well they monetize your data it's 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 it's, it's a moot question as to who actually owns it and it's changing with regulatory environments in Europe and around the world so ownership is a okay it's so a bit vague but they but they monetize your their business model is to take your data turn it into cash so does a third party licensing firm pay Facebook? Is that one of the ways that Facebook is monetizing? Are they getting paid? Your, Cambridge was paying the third party. Is the third party then paying Facebook for part of that? Um, I mean, the data was collected using one of the Facebook apps, um, which if you're on Facebook, you probably know about. But. Um, uh, uh, but it was, it, it was a quiz that people filled in. Now, there's various different types of app developers, and some of them may pay Facebook. I don't know. The, 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 um, uh, the organization uh, that we licensed the data from uh, was associated with um, Cambridge University, and I understand that they were doing it as part of, that they had, that they had gathered the data as part of an academic program. Um, I can't really say very much more about their relationship with Facebook, and there's a huge amount of investigatory effort going on, I think, into trying to understand it. So we will all find out in due course, I guess. We're going to talk more about you know, how to solve a lot of these problems going forward, but let, let, this is probably a good time for me to ask you. Do you think that 
uh, Facebook is in the business, as you say, to mon monetize your information. Uh, I guess in some respect, uh, so is Twitter, right? Because uh, Twitter is going to monetize uh, target ads based on yeah. who you follow and uh, what you might tweet about. Yep. And then obviously Google's the business of monetizing your search results. Are do you see these? Do you see these business models? as these are the business models, what they're going to look at, what they're going to look like 10 years from now? Or, or are these companies, as they continue to grow their user base, are they going to have to find other ways to monetize their user base? Or is this a, is this a long-term growth business still? What well, a good question. So I think that um, the business model is almost certainly going to change. Uh, I think that the, the, there's a huge amount of pressure from the public to control their data and what's done with it um, themselves. And, um, and there's regulatory issues coming in to that effect. What I think is going to happen is that uh, people are going to be able to take control of their data and they're going to be able to grant access to these platforms to be able to monetize it. And they're going to expect to share in some of that financial reward for doing it. And so um, uh, I think that there will be a huge development in technology, in intermediary technology, between individuals and these platforms in order to enable that. And I'll give you an example. Imagine if you had an app on your phone. And imagine you could turn your data on, and you see ads that are of interest to you, and you earn money. Or you can turn it off, and you see random ads, and you don't earn any money. Now, then people can decide what they want to do. Um, just by a show of hands, how many uh, of you here in the audience are on Facebook? Okay, so essentially, I would say 80% of, of those, for those that are watching this on video. And so how many of you would be willing, let's say, if Facebook said, we're not going to share your data, but in order to, provi to provide the platform for you, we're going to charge you $2 a month. Um, is there anybody that raised their hand that would not continue to utilize the platform? So for $2 a month, you would not do it. So roughly half would not be willing to pay. Uh, and is that, a, is that, would that be all social media platforms? Is there anything you, you would be willing to pay for? Yeah, so you'd be willing to pay for Twitter because it's a news feed. And you'd be willing to pay for Google because you need the search. So link, but LinkedIn is a subscription-based model. That's yes. not a that's not a free service. Yeah, it's a, it's, is, only a so yeah. it's only a subscription-based model if you pay for the premium. Right. The the basic okay. mass LinkedIn model works on exactly the same business. Is model. is is that sort of impromptu survey? See, I'm trying to be uh, I'm trying to do some data collection here myself. <laughs> is that is that impromptu survey uh, characteristic of what you think we'd see if we had a thousand people answering a similar? Uh, Paul? Yeah, yeah, I, th I think it is. I think it is. And, you know, I'd add another question. If, um, given that Facebook gives you a free platform, how many people are bothered by the fact they use your data to target ads? How many? For, how the, many, for how the video many? record, that was zero. Right, zero, zero are bothered by this. How many are concerned that they're sharing? not for the advertising, but they're sharing your information with potential third-party uh, marketers or th third-party information gatherers of things that you might have done last weekend or, uh, again, and I, not identifying you by name and address, but identifying you with IP address. How many of you, are you concerned with that? So roughly, roughly half, yeah. Um, you know, but I, I don't, know, but I I know don't my think they son, do that, by the way. <laughs> my, my, my middle son, who graduated uh, college uh, a couple of years ago, works in banking now, uh, he erased his entire digital profile uh, about six months ago. Um, made a determination that uh, he did not want to have any, any history anywhere. That was pre like Brett Kavanaugh or anything like that. So, so, so clearly, at, and, and, and let me reference um, uh, today's paper, uh, some of you may have seen Tim Cook, uh, CEO of Apple, uh, was calling for what one could uh, define as 
it's now time that there's got to be some international standards set for what this data, uh, uh, what, what can be used with the data, uh, who's collecting it, and, and, and it's really got to be international in scope. Now, one could read this piece and say, well, you know, Apple can say that because they're not in the free, they're not, they're not giving a service and a platform for free. In fact, they're, the, they're the quite the opposite. Um, but if one was to read an op-ed that uh, Julian had put together, um, I guess at this point it, it was uh, six a few, months? A few weeks ago. Oh, it was six weeks ago? Six yeah, months. something like that. Yeah. Um, was basically what, what uh, Cook was saying, which is that you now believe, based on your experience and based on what some of this data has been used for, that um, in order to protect uh, not just the users, but basically um, the society as a whole, that we've got to move this in a direction. I don't want to, why, why don't you walk us through the op-ed. There was basically two fundamental things that you felt were necessary, one at the corporate level and then one at the government level in order to um, allow for the free collection of data um, and allow for this group and, and the billions of people that are using these platforms to have some sort of protection, but also some more transparency. Yeah. So, so just, just, let's just back up a little bit and put it in the context of Cambridge Analytica and what happened to Cambridge Analytica, which is it exploded earlier this year. Um, and it exploded primarily because there was such a media storm um, uh, hurricane that hit it that, um, uh, that it couldn't survive anymore. And I think that it hit it for a, you know, a bunch of reasons. I think that it found itself at the nexus of um, uh, uh, anti-Trump sentiment, anti-Brexit sentiment, anti-Facebook sentiment, and concern about big data in general. Um, and there were other things that were like pouring fuel uh, onto the flame of that, but, but, but that, that, that's really where it was operating. And the media storm just killed it. But I'll say to you, I think that Cambridge Analytica was largely regulatory compliant. Um, we've just talked about the licensing of the data, and that might not have been regulatory compliant all along the supply chain, but Cambridge Analytica, I think, was in, in a good place. And actually, we worked very hard and spent a fortune trying to be regulatory compliant on both sides of the Atlantic. But that clearly wasn't enough. Because one thing that we manifestly did not achieve was having public confidence in what we were doing. I think we scared people. So, you know, if, if I come out, out of that and I think about well, what does it mean it's, it's, the, the lessons are not just about one company. The lessons are for all companies. Because today, all companies are data companies. My hairdresser is a data company today. My gardener's a head. I don't have a gardener, actually. But, um, uh, but my cleaner is a, uh, is, is, is a data company. Uh, my bank is. My car company is. They're all data companies. And what we've got what, what I think is essential is that we uh, is that the, is that the companies that are data companies, so therefore <coughs> all companies, need to own the issue of public confidence, because data science, data analytics, artificial intelligence, deep learning, all of these things have the potential to deliver huge value to humanity, but they will only do that if the public has confidence in them and allows them to do it. So what does it mean? And this is, it, it was the meat of the op-ed that Gary was talking about, was that what it means is that, um, is that companies need to set up processes and procedures inside their company that evaluate, understand, and sign off on new technology, new sources of data, that they're evaluated and understood all the way up to the board level. And this is no small ask. Understand that today there are artificial intelligence models that don't know themselves why they take certain decisions. Let alone the techies who, who, who wrote them, let alone the techies managers, let, let alone the, the, the members of the board. So it's not a small ask. But if public confidence is to be is, is, is to be secured to enable this technology to deliver the value, then 
there has to be a system in place that would allow that to be properly assessed under, un, un, under well-defined procedures. And I also think that companies need to have a very, very clear ethical statement about what it is they do with data, what data they do it with, and why they do it. What's the utility that they get from doing it? And so every time there is an innovation that comes along, it's evaluated against that public ethical standard. And then maybe what we can start to do is to provide some transparency, because what scares people is the black box. Now, we made some other mistakes. We went round, certain people in the company went round talking about um, uh, how brilliant our technology was to the extent that we knew what people were going to do before they did. And I'm going to share with you now that was overstated. But, um, um, but th this idea of this bigger black box where people can't understand what's going on inside and can't opt out is, is, um, is what the obstacle to uh, public confidence is. So opting out is another key part of it. Regulation is part of it. There should be regulation. I'm a, I'm, I'm, I'm a supporter of regulation, but I'm going to say to you, regulation's not enough. It can't keep pace with the speed of technology innovation. The regulators, at best, can regulate known technology or something that's imminently foreseeable. And this technology is moving at a million miles an hour. So only the people that are inside the organization that are operating it can understand it, and there need to be clear, clear procedures for evaluating what's being done and ensuring that it's in line with, with external ethical standards, even to the point where you know, maybe that th each company should have a chief ethics officer that's at a board level position and is responsible for ensuring ethical use of, uh, of personal data. Well, many companies have, they, they're, 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 they may not be called ethics officers the way you talk about in the op-ed, but there are companies that, uh, for example, Penn, you probably recall, like at Morgan Stanley, you know, the franchise committee which is basically to maintain that Morgan Stanley uh, is always brought about in the, in, in the public in the most uh, positive way for the franchise. What I think, what, what you're saying is that every company should have a person or a group designated specifically for any information that we uh, are able to uh, monitor, not monitor, any, any information we put together on our customer base and you, many of you probably know, like Salesforce.com is exactly what you were talking about with your, your hairstylist, your gardener. Uh, they're basically putting all this information together. You're saying at the company level, don't want to put words in your mouth, but you'll correct me if I'm wrong, uh, this has to be treated almost uh, as important as any kind of intellectual um, property, whether it's actual uh, patents that a company may have, uh, if it's a pharmaceutical company, uh, the, the formularies on the drugs. You're saying that information needs to be treated at that same level. And so I would go further. I would say that actually those processes, a little bit like when quality systems, ISO 9000, ASA, I think is, is the, the American franchise of it, but you know, companies have certified quality systems to ensure that when quality issues arise, they're, 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 they're managed so they don't arise, and that, they, uh, and, and that if they do arise, they're managed in the right way. Those processes are certified, and I would say that the processes for managing data analytics and data processing within an organization also ought to be certified. What that would mean is that you know, a company like Morgan Stanley that wanted to um, engage a supplier or a service provider would only engage somebody that was certified um, uh, in accordance with, 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 with this sort of data management or data ethics processing. Because otherwise, how can Morgan Stanley have, how can Morgan Stanley manage its own franchise if it can't have confidence in its suppliers? Let's just go back to Facebook for one second. Um, if 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 Zuckerberg called you up and said, um, you know, our user base has declined as a result of people that have wanted to leave the platform because of the Cambridge Analytica concern, or people that, as a result of Cambridge people started to recognize the fact that the information, the cookies, was being monetized. What would your advice be to Facebook, from your, from your point of view, as to what they should be doing with customer, client, user interaction in this new digital world? Transparency and openness. What scares people is what they don't know, for the most part. And if people know it and they don't want to be part of it, then they have the opportunity 
and the right to opt out. So that's fine. But well, you're it, not talking about like a 30 page user agreement that gets sent that nobody's going to read. No, I'm not talking about that. You're talking about like a very uh, sort of in your face uh, note. This you are inputting data and this is what we're going to do with the data. And the, yeah, and this is our business model and this is how we're able to provide this platform to you for free. And this is what we don't do with it. What, um, since I see that my uh, wife, the Facebook user in the family has walked in here, I'm going to ask this question now that you're here. So if she sends an email utilizing her, she still uses AOL by the way and pays for it. <laughs> If she, if she sends an email on, on using her AOL address to a friend, mm -hmm. is Facebook able to access the conversation in that email to target an ad? I don't think so. But if, I, I can't see how they would. Okay, but if, if there is a discussion on the Facebook platform about some specific item or merchandise, they take that information and that's what they are then able to sell directly. Yeah, they can analyze that content, they'll analyze the things that she likes, um, they'll probably analyze the, uh, the places that, that she goes to. I think they consider location to be one of the um, core entities within the um, Facebook architecture. And utilizing that example, is that in your mind an evasion of privacy if, it's not, if, it, if the user base is not aware of that? If the user base is it an invasion of privacy, I think I think it's concerning if the user is not aware of it, aware of it. Yeah, yeah. So and this is where I come back to transparency is the key to us being able to utilize these technologies. It doesn't need to take place in secret. So the eighty percent of you who raised your hand and said you know that you utilize Facebook and and uh, are you all aware of what they're doing with your data? Were you aware of this a year ago? Every one of you. No? No? Yes? And again, just by like a show of hands, and we'll sort of tell the video in terms of percentages, um, none of you are changing your user habits as a result of what's happened here in the last year. Now, so everybody continues. So it's interesting. You said that Cambridge, um, because of the reputational risk or the concern as a result of this, uh, it had a major impact in terms of the business model, yet the people, the user base, if this is a good sample audience, you know, continues to want to utilize the free platform and they want to continue to provide their data. And they want to see ads that are of interest to them. I mean, I don't want to see ads for ladies' shoes, and I'm guessing that you know, m most of you know, the young ladies in the front row there don't want to see ads for um, rugby matches. So, all right, so, we'll, so before we open it up to some questions. I could be wrong there, of course. That, that'll, that'll be much more um, uh, in tune with the user, the, the user experience, given that I'm not a user, um, I just want to ask, because these are the students and, and part of the uh, objective of this program is to have these students go out to the, go out to the career world with more knowledge. Um, I think you've done a good job in terms of, if I'm one of them, certainly I'm going to go and, and pitch myself to uh, uh, public relations or, or um, companies that are doing um, uh, media uh, connectivity that this is a, something that, 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 that this digital sort of police officer internally sounds to me like a, a great growth career opportunity. Um, I, I, I think that there's a, I mean, there's a huge amount of work that, 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 that needs to be done. But I'll but I tell you where I think it is. We've got to start having the discussion. And the discussion's got to involve everybody. It's got to involve users. It's got to involve regulators. It's got to involve tech giants, but also ordinary companies probably even got to involve villains like me. You optimistic that there will be some kind of international standard, say five years from now? Seven. <laughs> well, a lot of damage can be done, you know, yeah. between now and seven years. Well, I, but, I, but I think that, you know, the steps along the path to doing this is that, you know, companies taking ownership of the problem, they can take ownership of the problem before there's international standards. They can take ownership of the problem, they can make clear ethical statements, they can ensure that they've got procedures in place to manage what's being done and make sure what's being done is known by more than a handful of data science in the, um, uh, in, in the AI department. And I can see that standards will come 
as, as, as that gains traction. So really, you know, I always have my investor hat on. Unfortunately, it sounds as though you're saying large companies that are going to take the initiative on this, um, that are willing to basically lock down and, and lock down information gathering to the point where customers, clients will all have that immediate transparency, are probably those companies that will, especially like, for example, in financial services, those are the companies you want to be in business with. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, I got to believe that in terms of um, in terms of banking and financial services, um, one has to be deeply concerned in terms of what they're going to eventually do with that data. Yeah, because they're not looking to sell ads, uh, but they're certainly looking to um, monetize that in in, in in any way they can. Yeah, yeah. Any legal and regulatory compliant way they can. Yep. Um, all right. Well, with that, let's open it up to some uh, some small questions from the audience. I guess for the purposes of the camera here, we'll, we'll repeat it so that, uh, yes. So you were saying in seven years how there's going to be like a lot of regulations put on. So how do you see that impact like a Facebook business plan or a Twitter or Instagram where they monetize based on ads? So how do you see those regulations kind of impact? Okay, a few points there. One, one, number one is I don't want to be held to the seven years. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and number two is, um, the, the regulation, I think, will come faster. It's already in Europe. There's, um, as Gary mentioned, there's um, uh, people standing up daily, and there's organizations um, issuing, trying to influence or, t or trying to input to the debate about what regulation should be like in the US. Um, and I think that that really speaks to that there's an acceptance amongst the industry that there should be regulation in the US. And I think that'll come quicker. Um, but what, what I was talking about is, is that this, the companies owning the problem and owning the problem of inspiring public confidence. And, um, uh, and that will take longer. For an organization like Facebook, they have an opportunity to lead the charge here if, uh, uh, if they're smart. Um, they don't need to be secretive. Their business model is fairly transparent if you think about it. If they think they're hiding it, then, th then um, uh, then they're wrong. So they have the opportunity to be really transparent, really open, to, make, to, 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 to set up processes and procedures so that what they're doing is well understood all the way through the organization, or all the way up the organization, and to make clear ethical statements. But a clear ethical statement, what I would say, is needs to be that. It's not just enough to say something like Google. It says, do no harm. What does that mean? I mean, in this space, one man's harm is another man's utility. If I don't want my data access to target ads, it's harm to me. If you do, it's utility. So it needs to be much more specific. I have just a quick follow-up on that. Is there anything that Facebook has that they still try to monetize that you would advise they shouldn't? Is there anything on the platform that you think should not be um, information or data that they should have monetized? Um, I'm, I'm not the person to answer that question. So, no is the answer, but I wouldn't. I don't think I'd know. Go ahead. Um, you were mentioning how companies should have those clear ethical standards and how um, Gary mentioned the term and conditions is probably not the best place to put it. In your opinion, like, how would you like recommend that companies do communicate their changes? I'd I'd put as a banner across the top of the page every time you were. Uh, um, logged on. I mean, the problem with those terms and conditions is nobody reads them. Yeah. And the reason nobody reads them is because they were written by lawyers to protect the company from everything that they could possibly imagine, which makes it an appalling job to wade through. And none of us read them. Lawyers don't read them. Lawyers go straight to the bottom and click on the uh, click on the button. So. Um, it, it, it needs to be very prominent and they need to communicate regularly about it. I think people are and would be interested, um, but th they, they're a communications company. They, ch they, they could communicate easily about it or they could obfuscate it. You've been talking about restoring trust and confidence, and one topic that I felt didn't come up today was censorship and what Facebook and Twitter should be doing to promote confidence and debate. What is your view? Should they be censoring the content? 
confidence or how, do, how does that play into the transparency dialogue? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. And, and again, I, I, I'm not sure that I am necessarily you know, any more qualified than anyone else in the room to, to answer that, but that won't stop me speaking about it. Um, is I think they've got a real challenge. I think they've got a real challenge because they've built a network that enables billions of communication channels between individuals um, around the world, multi-directional communication channels. They can't afford to have someone sit there reading everything that gets posted and then taking a, uh, uh, a decision on, um, on you know, is it acceptable, isn't it acceptable, did it come from the Russians or didn't it come from the Russians or, yeah. Um, so I think they've got a real challenge. I, I wish I had the answer, um, but I think that what they can do is that they can put in some intelligence, artificial intelligence, some sort of, of data mining that can look for flags, um, but They've got to tread a balance there between, you know, being liberal, and um, uh, and and also not being offensive. So, actually, as I'm thinking, talking, thinking, uh, maybe they should do that, and maybe they should say very clearly what they do and where the line is. But but and in be that transparent. But but using using AI in in a situation like that, it's sort of what you were talking about with the you know, traditional data, data, uh, uh, data gathering, which is, you know, sort of garbage in, garbage out. Meaning that if you create the AI to look for certain buzzwords or you look for the AI to look for certain responses, they'll be making determinations about what is appropriate for the platforms based on whatever they think may be offensive. Yes. I mean, it doesn't seem to me like a solution. No, no. So what I was saying, the bit yeah. that I added on the end was that actually they have to then be, they, they should be very transparent and public about what they think is offensive, what they're stopping, what they're not stopping, yeah. um, and why they're doing it. I mean, it's it, it's not easy, but um, you have an opinion of they're, the. They're, they're coming under a lot of pressure to stop offensive content, yeah. and 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 they're going to have to do something about that. Do you have an opinion of the social media platforms who's doing? Uh, who's doing the best job at at allowing free speech, but also being mindful of 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 things that have to be removed? Um, no, I don't. I think it's a real mixed bag, and you know, when it comes to free speech, there's some companies that do really well here and don't do well in China, and there's some companies that do really well in some cases and don't do really well in others. And I think it's a mixed bag. So, I feel like. We talked a lot about the acquisition of data and the sort of ethical considerations around that and transparency, letting the users know this what we're collecting, how we're using it. I think one of the bigger concerns, at least for me, and I think for a lot of people, is the weaponization of that information. Um, so I'm thinking about examples like Bell Pottinger, where you could have a scenario where the company is in regulatory compliance and how they got the data, but they have a client with various agenda, and so they're using that to manipulate people based on the information that they have. So I think that's a significant problem for people in PR and communications. Our jobs in many respects are to influence perception and behavior. So where do you draw the line between, you know, doing that in an honest, ethical way and, you know, borderline propaganda that's driven through this really intense So, hybrid. again, to your question, and what Coke was talking about, um, which was taking the data and then using it in uh, negative and hostile ways. Yeah. So I think you, you need to segment the question a little bit. Um, negative and hostile is like, you know, doesn't say very much. What do we really mean? Fake news, um, I don't think there's, there's any place for in an ethical organization, period. Bell Pottinger or anybody else making up stories um, uh, and promulgating uh, lies, nonsense, to, to fear, it, th there is no place for. Um, I think that um, if companies are you know, taking data and using it to try and understand you know, what are issues that are, uh, that, that are important for people and to communicate to them about that issues, which means that not everybody sees the same issue, um, I think they sh 
it, it, they should say that that's what they're doing, that they are analyzing data and that's why they're doing it and, that, and, and, that's, and that's how they're, uh, they're targeting and they should be open and transparent about it. I think that, um, you know, if we, if we take the political world for a minute, in the US, when a political ad goes out, it needs to say on it who's, who sponsored it and who funded it. Um, in, the, in the UK, and I don't know all about Europe, but I, certainly in the UK there's a big debate going on now which, which, um, uh, which is suggesting that uh, uh, we should have the same thing, and I think that we should. Mm. And I also think that there should be a repository somewhere for a political organization that has all the ads that they've put out so people can go. So I don't just, so I don't <laughs> just know what ads I've seen but I, I can go somewhere and see all the ads that they've put out and I can you know, evaluate that and they can be judged by it. Um, there's probably many other things as well. I'd, 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 I'm not sure that I can think of or address all of them, but you know, if you approach it from a, you know, a, a fairly sensible ethical position, it's not that hard. Tony? Twenty thousand. Twenty thousand. Pick a number, and how might that work? So, um, all right. So the reason I, I what, what, what for those that, that are not familiar, what is ISO? What, what are we referring to? Can you just? Yeah, I can. Yeah. So the International Standards Organization is an organization which accredits companies and institutions, government agencies, but accredits organizations as having appropriate and considered standards in place within the organization to manage quality and 14,000 to manage their environmental impact. It's not prescriptive, it doesn't tell companies what to do, but it does go in and audit the systems they have in place and certifies them as having systems in place, appropriate systems in place to manage their issues. So, and, and, and I think that something similar for you know, data operations is um, entirely appropriate. The reason that I said, uh, uh, that, that I, uh, I expressed some skepticism about there being a global standard, it was, it was mentioned yesterday in the, um, in the Apple uh, announcement or the Apple call for a global standard. And actually, you know, it, that feels a little bit like kicking it into the long grass. I mean, do you have any idea how long it took to have the international maritime laws agreed by all nations? It was hundreds of years. And, and, and they don't get changed today. They don't get changed because nobody's got appetite to start that discussion again with all these governments. Companies can be more agile. And so if we can get a discussion going and if we get acceptance that, that ethical management of data is something which is in the company's interest, in business interests, in public interests, then this can come about much faster than the idea of there being a single global regulation. I think some sort of legislation will, will and should come here in the US. Um, I mean, my own view on GDPR is that it's, it's somewhat overburdensome, it's over, uh, over-regulated, and the problem with that is, is that at A, it stifles innovation, but B, it, it, it causes people to take their eye off the ball as to what's important. 
Uh, you spend all your time making sure that you've ticked every box. It's very easy to get to forget <coughs> that there are ethical considerations that aren't enshrined um, uh, within uh, within the regulations. Dave, every country has their own air traffic control system, but when a plane flies out of the United States and gets picked up over Nova Scotia by the European air traffic control system, then the planes are going to be crashing into each other left and right because there's. That each country has their own air traffic control, but they've got to have the handoff. So, you know, these devices, if you're going to use social media one way in the United States, and then a different way, given the fact that much of the information that's being promoted, you don't know where the origin is. You have no idea. So, it's, uh, you know, it's not, it's, there, there is no standard unless it's a global standard. You know? And I think about that against the backdrop of the congressional hearings with Zuckerberg, where basically legislators displayed their ignorance. Of well, I was going to say, that was one of the most embarrassing, you know, people, this, the news cycle is so crazy that that seems like it was 10 years ago, yeah. <laughs> but that was one of the most embarrassing things. I mean, the, the senators and the congressmen, I mean, it was, it was humiliating, uh, the, the Q&A that was, that was happening. You know, see, with so many other things happening, you know, maybe post the election, in a couple of weeks it'll be back in the forefront, but who knows? I have to ask you about the election before we wrap this up also. Yes? Uh, I was going to ask, um, do you think that this would be an example of kind of like out of first kind of disadvantage for Cambridge and not other companies if they think they're the collection companies that are kind of like really on the side of acting like that? Do you think that this is not kind of getting any better what a great question. I think the answer is yes. <laughs> yeah. There was always going to be, to my mind... Wait, uh, Julie. Oh, yeah, the question was, was Cambridge um, at a disadvantage by being a first mover? There's a lot of companies doing big data collection now. Was the fact that Cambridge was at the forefront of this actually a disadvantage, having been in the public domain? And the answer was yes. Um, uh, because I, I think in retrospect, you know, having looked at what happened, tried to understand what happened, there was always going to be a Cambridge Analytica. It just sucks for me it was Cambridge Analytica. Yeah. Um, but, but, but there was always going to be actually what Cambridge Analytica was doing. I think that we were at the leading edge of the technology, but there were lots of companies doing similar things and trying to do similar, similar things. And I don't even know if we were the best. I think that we were very good. And there's still companies today doing those things. Um, so, yes, there was a, a first mover disadvantage and uh, actually it's testament to the fact that you can have too much publicity. Um, uh, and if we don't do something different about the way that we ethically manage these types <laughs> of activities, there will be more Cambridge Analyticas. Um, so, Pen. Yeah, we were victims of our own publicity machine to a certain extent because in the lead up to the election, we didn't think that Trump was going to win. So we'd invested really heavily in getting the message out, building relationships with journalists, getting the story out. Was, the, our story was that it would have been much, he'd have, he'd have lost much more without us. Um, and of course, having primed the ground in that way, then when he won, we were um, victims of our own success. Uh, and, uh, and the thing just took off because once the story started it went around the world um, like nobody's business. We didn't spend that much time thinking about ethical considerations. We spent a lot of time thinking about regulatory compliance. Well, well you brought it up and so my thinking an hour ago when you were talking about identifying where there was a digital uh, hole and where you could fill that digital hole uh, versus uh, the Obama coalition. Mm -hmm. um, clearly Cambridge, you said it, I'll repeat it, 
were instrumental in helping Trump get elected. So what are your thoughts, uh, and again, this is an off the record event, so we can say, what are your thoughts about, <laughs> about what's gonna happen uh, in a couple of weeks here in the States, given the fact that people are much more aware, let's say, of the kind of data, they're, they're, they're much more aware of the data collection and they're certainly much more aware of the targeted ads than they were uh, three years ago. So do you think, do you think the digital impact is going to be as forceful in these midterms? Um, so, okay, so there's a, there's, there's a few bits to that. I think there's a, because we're in midterms, there's a lot of, <coughs> lot smaller races going on. Which means that the amount of money being invested in each race is a lot smaller. Um, and so I don't think it's being analyzed to the same extent um, as it was when there was a, uh, a, 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 the, the presidential elections going on. The budgets for digital activity are, the individual budgets for digital activity are smaller and the budgets for collecting data and doing research and doing data analytics are smaller. So I think it'll be less. Um, uh, but nevertheless, it's going on. The technology advances, I mean, it's two years on now since um, uh, uh, the Trump election, and the technology has advanced in that time and continues to advance, so it's more efficient. Uh, and, um, and people are uh, seeking to use it within, you know, within the limits of more uh, uh, restricted budgets. Also, I think that um, this is a really unusual election because the level of engagement of the electorate in this election is higher than it's ever been, um, which is, you know, a healthy thing. So, um, uh, and people are feeling very passionate about it. I'm not sure, given the speed of what's changed and the more limited budgets, that it's as easy to uh, segment the audience in the way that I was describing earlier. Right. Quick, quick naive follow-up. Does the lower budgets and the lower digital advertising spending benefit one of the two parties at the, at the top level? No, and I think that's, there's, a, there's a really interesting and important associated point uh, uh, with this, which is, you know, does this digital activity you know, affect the fairness of elections? And uh, elections have taken place with you know, different parties, different candidates, looking to get one over or think of ways of doing new things or new ways of connecting with, it, with, with electors uh, and, and, and new ways of, um, of rubbishing their, um, trashing their, um, their opponents. <laughs> um, and that's gone on forever. And actually there's a new technology. The only, the only time that I think that uh, it becomes unfair if that it, it is there's manifestly a technology which one side has and the other hasn't. And it will always be a case of, you know, two party system here, two parties competing with each other to, uh, to be uh, one ahead. Of course the Republicans don't have Cambridge Analytica this time and you can draw your own conclusion about that. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we, we, were, we were moving heavily into the commercial market uh, and, and that, that was a major activity for us um, earlier this year. Yeah, I mean I think there's all sorts of reasons as to why Cambridge Analytica is out of business and, and we, we, probably, we, we almost certainly would have attracted less heat if we hadn't been in the political market. I mean the four elements I said to you that came together, well one of them wasn't true. So we were never in Brexit, and the UK Electoral Commission, just after we had to close the company, they stood up and said, yes, actually, they were right, it's true what they said, they weren't in the Brexit election. Um, we wouldn't have been in Trump, so we, we, we would have had much less heat on us.
if Donald Trump were not the Republican nominee and say Marco Rubio was or someone else than Trump? Um, I'm going to say probably not. I mean, and I think this is a personal opinion, but but but, but I think that um, p people either love or hate Trump to a greater extent than they do with, um, uh, I'll say, more traditional candidates. Yeah. 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 I'll say it. I'll say it out loud. The liberal media were furious, were furious, and needed someone to blame. Yeah, yeah. That's what I wanted to say. <laughs> my 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 my, my opinion is a traditional candidate. It would have been seen as that was a smart use of data. Yeah. Not the biggest deal. Agreed. You know, they were they were strategic. There was, a, there was another element which, which was different about this, and it's this whole Russian involvement. I mean, we were blamed for being the link to Russia as well. You know, it was, there was a lot of um, concern and, and, and um, outcry well, the, about the, this. The, the link to Russia in the sense of, of um, Russian interference. Russian interference utilizing the platforms, not Russian, not linked to Russia in the sense that Russia was utilizing Cambridge to then do any, they weren't using you as an influencer. They were, no, that was an allegation. So, as, as Penn says, yeah. um, it, they were not using us as an influencer. Right. We had no contact with Russians, let me say that very clearly. Right. But accusations of us being the, 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 the Russian puppet were out and about, along with a whole host of other nonsense stories. I would say 85% of what was written about Cambridge Analytica was nonsense. See, Penn, I, I guess I'm, that's a perfect example. Uh, not understanding how the whole platform even worked, I at least was able to ascertain that, that there was no direct linkage in any way, shape, or form that Cambridge was uh, selling information or, or providing information. But I guess your point is that it was still out there in the media, and so the perception was there. Yeah, and and even the information commissioner in the uh, in well, the, the, president, the president would have asked were you selling the information to the Chinese. Yeah, we wouldn't have done that. It's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, before we wrap this up, I mean, this was this flew by. This was fantastic. I have to ask a question of all of you, and then I'll let Julian give uh, a final a final comment. Um, since we talked about it, and he was unaware, can any of you tell me how I could go into my own Google and see what they? <laughs> Is it, has anybody done that? Because I want to know. No? Okay. I'll look it up for you and I'll... Yeah, yeah. You. Because <laughs> you, can, you can find out how they are looking at your cookies and... Okay. Because when it says, you know, access to cookies, I always just click that through like one of those consent things. Yeah. Probably don't want to do that from now on. Well, it depends. Do you want to see ads that are interesting to you? I don't want to see any ads. Well, you unfortunately, you don't have that option. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyhow, Julia, let, 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 um, this has been really... Uh, informative, amazing, and, and, and just really, uh, you're all getting quite a, an insight into how this all worked and what happened. Um, any final thoughts that you want to share in terms of your wisdom for, for this group of people and those that are watching here? No, I just think that, you know, th 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 this is a really exciting time to be in communications. Um, the technology is amazing and it's advancing at such a rate and it's incredibly powerful and as you go on throughout your you know, careers in communications, do your best to use it as ethically as you can. I've learned, yeah. Um, uh, use it as ethically as you can, and it can deliver huge benefit to society. Um, so you know, I think you're gonna have a really, really interesting career. Well, fantastic, on behalf of Tony and Ed, I wanna thank Pan, I wanna thank you, Julian, and, uh, and, and thank you, everybody. Thank you.